Today's World Insights with Tian Wei. China's big push for blockchain, the harbinger of a snowballing digital evolution, and the reach of Russian diplomacy. How's it building ties in the Middle East, the West, and China? And here's our host, Tian Wei. Hello and welcome to World Insight, coming to you live from Beijing on CGTN. We begin our program today with the big push for blockchain in China. Recently, Chinese President Xi Jinping underscored the fledgling technology in pursuing innovation. China has stepped up efforts to make use of blockchain in broad areas in recent years. The idea of blockchain may sound new to some, yet it's worth the attention and certainly understanding on a wide basis. Before we get down to a discussion, let's take a look at this. Chinese President Xi Jinping lost no time emphasizing how vital blockchain is for China's digital growth. He said, the integrated application of blockchain technology plays an important role in the new round of technological innovation and industrial transformation. We must take the blockchain as an important breakthrough for independent innovation of core technologies clarify the main direction, increase investment, focus on a number of key technologies, and expedite the development of blockchain and innovation-driven industrial development. Markets heard President Xi's blockchain announcement, the value of cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, which rely on blockchain, shot up 12% on Friday from a five-month low. Other major cryptocurrencies like Ethereum and Litecoin also rose. So what is blockchain and how does it work? As the name implies, every block on a digital chain stores information. Different from ledgers or bookkeeping, one needs to create a new block instead of rewriting an old one if one intends to change any information. There's no center in a chain with more power than another. The technology can be used in broad areas including finance, agriculture, and even intellectual property protection because it ensures the authenticity and safety of information in transactions. One of blockchain's major uses, cryptocurrency, has been way more controversial while gaining popularity worldwide. New data has revealed that Bitcoin's value has ballooned to 11 trillion US dollars since 2009 when it was created. At present, the network is processing $9.5 billion every day. Bitcoin has surpassed PayPal's annual transaction volume, $578 billion in 2018, in just two months. Cryptocurrency has spread to many countries, but it is facing tighter regulation due to its anonymity and cross-border features. China has banned the initial coin offerings and exchanges, but recently, according to a senior official of the People's Bank of China's payment department, China's central bank is close to launching its own digital currency after years of research and development in the area. Blockchain has also been tested. Could blockchain disrupt the digital world? And how will it change the real economy and politics? Blockchain development in China and from China, let's ask the ABC and probably beyond. How can it be done? In our Beijing studio, we have Andy Chen, the Fun City Holding Chairman. In Shanghai, we invited Raymond Yuan, the founder and CEO of Fundamental Labs. And joining us in Singapore, originally certainly from China, Helen Hai, the head of the Blockchain Charity Foundation. I want to welcome the three of you. And probably this is the youngest panel I've ever had since the very beginning of the program. In fact, uh, several years ago, Welcome to the show. Uh, may I go to you, uh, Helen, first about uh, your reaction to the statement last Friday by the Chinese President Xi Jinping, namely here, I quote, take blockchain as important breakthrough to achieve independence of core technologies. For someone who has been working on this field for several years already, what is your response when you heard the news? First of all, I want to say I'm really glad to hear the news. 
Why? There are two things. Number one, I think currently blockchain technology is still at the early stage of development. It's still technology looking for application. So what is really needed is industry shapers. So I'm really glad to see China want to play a major role on shaping the industry to the right direction. And secondly, from a global perspective, I was born in 1978. I have to say I'm the beneficiary of China's second industrial revolution. I witnessed 680 million people has been lifted out the international poverty line from the second industrial revolution. And then let's look at the third industrial revolution, which is internet-based. Mm. What happened to the world? Actually, 1% of the global population is holding 90% of the global wealth. Yes, we're celebrating the technological advancement, but the world if globally probably didn't become a better place. Right. That is why I think at the early stage of the fourth industrial revolution, we really need a strong hand to actually to shape the direction. Technology should work for people and values. I see. That is why to see in the direction from China, looking at you know how actually we can use technology also for poverty allocation, uh, a poverty elevation. This is a very very positive news. Besides, for global besides development. all of these important areas, uh, uh, Raymond, may I go to you? I mean, you and your colleagues have been investing in the area, trying to see when is the start of that industry from China. So what do you think? Is this going to help China to jumpstart into the blockchain competition? Where is China in the overall global map? Yeah, because uh, during the past three years, we did a lot of investment globally. Uh, we invested to a lot of leading companies. I think uh, for, ch uh, for China, we have uh, a lot of uh, advantages, not only in the world of the market, but we have a lot of uh, reservation of uh, the leading technology and also the, the key uh, competitor resource, you know, like the uh, Bitcoin mining and also the other uh, blockchain te technology. I think we are in a very uh, good position. In a good position, yes, indeed. Yeah. But at the same time, Andy, you've been hearing from around the world as to how it has been leveraged. For example, more than $11 trillion already being put into Bitcoin alone, which is only a small branch of where blockchain could lead us to. And also, you also hear from Switzerland, there's already a blockchain valley, hundreds of enterprises developing over there. Several years, the world has been changing a lot. So Andy, where is China from your perspective? Yeah, I believe in Bitcoin because I think Bitcoin will be ending the US dollar and Germany. And, uh, you know, blockchain is used for the uh, fair and uh, reliable and rules for the new economy system, the future economy system. So. We need a, a, a lower money, a lower, a lower concurrency that, like Bitcoin, to make the the whole digital um, economy system will be more fair and reliable. Mm, interesting. So, mm. Yeah. So I think the U.S. dollar, the fiat money will fail in one day, maybe in several years, in say three years or five years, they will crash a, a big economy shock, and uh, will happen. And then at, at that time, the Bitcoin will be the price will high, much more higher. And I think now Bitcoin is 10 years old, just a baby. And in, after 10 years later, it will be 20 years old. So it will be an adult. It will be officially go to work. One could tell, almost, Andy, you and your friends have been investing in Bitcoin, just from your answer. <laughs> Personal belief and against good investment opportunities. But besides the Bitcoin, which is not the point here, because we're talking about blockchain as a much bigger concept. Here's the thing, uh, Helen that you hear about blockchain. One of the, its most important characteristics is, here I quote, greater transparency, enhanced security, and traceability. That's what we, we know. And decentralization, Helen, is the key here. So how is that likely to play out in the China picture? Okay, first of all, I think blockchain is the second year of internet. Internet allowed the transfer of values. Blockchain should allow the transfer of, uh, sorry, internet allowed transfer of information. 
blockchain should allow transfer of value. And this is actually, a uh, blockchain should actually create a trust without institution. And then there should create more peer-to-peer -peer directly a uh, trust transfer. This is, it can apply into many areas. For example, uh, in charity space, actually in, at Binance Charity, we created a 100% transparent charity transaction process. This allowed actually the donors can transfer the values to the end beneficiaries directly mm. without intermediaries and everything's transparent. I think China is a huge country. It's very difficult actually to track down to the last mile. That is why this technology is providing a technology for us to achieving that goal. This is just one application. As I mentioned earlier, there could be many applications except Bitcoin in this whole process. That's why we need actually all stakeholders working together mm. to actually drive the technology to go in to the direction how we can benefit values and people. So who are they going to decide on the rules, uh, Raymond? That is usually one of the most important things that needs to be decided here. Of course, you could talk about that everybody could contribute on the blockchain. That's the beauty of it. But still, uh, we are seeing it at the, in, at the early stage. So what do you make of that? Yeah, I think uh, uh, everyone talk about the future. You know, we, we always talk about the, the future like a, a digital future. Everything is about the, the data, the algorithm, the computing power. So when you ask uh, who makes the rules, I think the, you know, the, the, uh, the most uh, important thing is who control the, the data, the algorithm, and That's the right. computing power. Mm. And who control these three, who control the rules. In this sense, about blockchain, what do you think? Yeah. Yeah, and also for blockchain, because uh, you know, uh, with blockchain technology, it can create a distributed uh, network, can utilize the data algorithm and also the computing power. So even when we talk about uh, the uh, blockchain, uh, like Bitcoin, just uh, use Bitcoin as an example. If you control the, uh, the most the computing power, uh, actually, in fact, you, you control the rules of uh, Bitcoin. But that is about 51% at least, right? That is uh, very hard to utilize in the world, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, despite of a, you know, a, a concept there, the reality is different. Isn't it, Raymond? Yes, yes, yes. It's very hard to control 51% of uh, the harsh rate. Why? That's why we, we say uh, the Bitcoin network is very safe. Uh, mm -hmm. and it's uh, renewable. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the things people talk about application of Bitcoin, uh, applications of blockchain rather, uh, and the A is about, you know, what kinds of meanings it would present to the rest of the world when it comes to currency. Uh, you earlier mentioned about Bitcoin, that's only one of the many applications of it. There could be other possibilities. Chinese Central Bank, for example, uh, research department had earlier suggested about China has been experimenting, experimenting what they call the central bank digital currency, CBDC, uh, or otherwise known as DCEP. Uh, but to what extent do you think that could be a Chinese way of utilizing blockchain technology. How much will that help China in a way as a rising economy be able to work for a fairer game rules yeah. in yeah. terms of currency? Yeah. So I think the blockchain used for the design the game rules and uh, is fair to the other to the older people so people have consensus to use the same game game the rules. So if you if you design an algorithm that's uh, like people can accept, so people have a consensus. Uh. So the the, chan, the CBDC it's a it's a good good method, a good test to try to use the um, the the coin to put the IMB in global. So the, you, you, we have to design a very fair method and algorithm that that the all the other people to trust, can trust in the CBDC. Mm. So I think think we can. And open all this blockchain system like the more entrepreneurs come in to design the um, different algorithm that people can choose. Yeah. So people will choose the right, right one, people will choose the, the fair one, people will choose the reliable one. So then we have a very fair economy system 
and then people will have the consensus. That's, that's a beautiful means world you have just described. Did you realize that? No, that's technology. I mean, technology I mean technology the world is not this. that perfect. I mean, by the way. So uh, let me come back to you, uh, Raymond, and also Helen about that. Now, it is about the rules, but it is also about what are some of the newest uh, development. Uh, China's uh, uh, CD rather CBDC is one of them. You also see, you know, the debate about Libra in the United States, uh, Capitol Hill. You see also other options. So fundamentally, what is the issue here? Is it about uh, the currency's future? Is it about the trade power? Is it about the geopolitics? What is exactly the nature of this whole debate? Uh, Helen, you want to go first in this regard? Okay, I think actually the powerful thing about blockchain technology, I would say actually it's a new tool actually to redefine the social contract. And in this perspective, it's not just government and individual. A business it can also play a very important role into this. So what China currently doing, I think it's definitely a very important, strong step forward. It's not a completely uh, perfect solution yet, but there's always a process. But compared with a lot of other countries, which is still unclear and not supportive for the innovation, I think China is making a very strong step forward. The other perspective, uh, I see actually China's uh, direction is also making a good way for globalization of RMB. And it's also very important, let's look at the global financial uh, uh, structure. Mm -hmm. We've got uh, the global population, but the current bottom billion people, they're not actually in the existing financial infrastructure. Personally, I don't think cryptocurrency is going to uh, replace fiat totally. Mm. But I think cryptocurrency can play a very important complementary to the current fiat system, which is the current financial uh, infrastructure. For example, if there's a Filipino maid working in China and he wa she wants to send money back to her home and in the village and her, her uh, relatives don't have a bank account. And I think this is how cryptocurrency can play a very cost-effective way, actually, in the new process. But uh, in the same logic, you could also see through cryptocurrency and uh, in a wider sense blockchain uh, that wealth can be transferred from one place to another without any boundary, of course. That's a benefit, but at the same time, that's also the danger that you could see financial danger as a result of this. Helen, briefly. Uh, that, that's very true, but I think that's why, to be honest, I think it's we still need to see how the future is going to be unfold. Mm -hmm. But that's why it's very important, I think it's going to be very beneficial for Chinese government to create an integrated and comprehensive platform to inviting private sector, uh, civil society, academic, and also public, you know, to looking at the benefit. But we have to know the technology is to serve the people. Yeah. It's very important to looking to uh, foster the innovation in this. Okay, Raymond, uh, there is a difference. Uh, for example, the Chinese system now is trying to produce from the central bank's support a CBDC. Uh, however, it is also running on two tiers as the research head of the central bank earlier illustrated. It is not just at the central bank level, but also with the involvement and participation of commercial banks so that they could be supportive of the system. But if you look at the Libra, it's totally a business initiative, even though it is trying to persuade uh, those politicians on the Capitol Hills to make national support for this. So how do you see this very different approach to a cryptocurrency possibility in two different countries and how do you see these are driving the changes and the trends in that regard Raymond I think it's, uh, it's open for different uh, trying I mean uh, the central government of, of China and uh, the Libra they give a uh, give different uh, uh, different uh, trying they have different uh, strategy for Libra I think the uh, right now they got a lot of uh, problem uh, from the uh, United States government, because uh, the key issue is their backed asset. Uh, if they if the if the backed asset is only a U.S. dollar, uh, not included the other forex and uh, other uh, asset class, I think the Libra the, the, the Libra has no threat to the U.S. dollar. Uh, but if uh, Libra the backed asset of Libra uh, has the other forex 
and uh, other uh, acid class. So then it's a totally different story. Uh, Libra can be a definitely a potential competitor of the US donor. And I think the strategy of the central government in China uh, is very smart, this strategy. Uh, the, as, it, as you mentioned, uh, we, uh, they use the, the two-tier uh, operating system. Mm. That means the, both the central bank and the, uh, and the, 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 um, uh, the commercial, commercial bank, bank mm. can play different roles in this. Yeah, commercial bank can, can play different roles in this system. So it has more have better compatibility uh, to the foreign uh, users. I mean, even the foreigners can use it. Uh, right. It can be compatible uh, to the different uh, authority and the central bank. All right. We yeah. have a very limited time, probably 40 seconds before we go. 10 seconds for every one of you. Where do you think blockchain is heading for from now? And once China has already made it quite a national policy, uh, Helen, you go first. 10 seconds for you. Okay, I would say I, I think uh, technology should become a best part of the human nature. B bring out the best part, which is creativity, uh, uh, sympathy, mm -hmm. and also shared destiny. I see. Uh, Andy, what do you say? So I think is we want to change society, be a better society. So how to change society is the dream behind the technology, not the technology itself. So we mm -hmm. want a more equal society and we want we want to more free economy system that's the, our dream i see yeah okay and probably blockchain could play a role it seems that you're trying to suggest the raymond last but not least yeah blockchain i say blockchain is uh, the key to the uh, digital future uh, it can definitely radically to change the world even it's only on the way all right, it is on the way already. Thank you so much for the thrill of you helping us to understand much better about blockchain and hopefully its potential. Andy Chen, Raymond Yuan, last but not least, Helen Hai. Thank you, really appreciate it. You're watching World Insight with me, Tianwei, still to come on our live program. The reach of Russian diplomacy, how it's building ties in the Middle East, the West, and China. Some insights right after the break. Welcome back. You're watching World Insight coming to you live from Beijing. I'm Tian Wei. Next, we turn to the ever-shifting sense of power in the Middle East. Russia may doubt the alleged killing of the ISIL leader claimed by the U.S. administration, but all can agree that Syria is far from elusive peace. Since the surprise U.S. pullout, the Syrian army has sent thousands of soldiers to its northern border to help Kurdish militia resist a Turkish offensive. Meanwhile, the area is also patrolled by joint Russian and Turkish forces. It was a deal welcomed by Iran, as complicated as it sounds. As Russia forces arrived in Syria, Washington said it was sending reinforcement to eastern Syria once again to prevent ISIL from seizing Syrian oil fields. That's at least claimed by Washington. So how will it all play out? Where is Russia in the map? Let's ask our panelists. And we are now joined in our studio in Beijing, Dmitry Trenin, who is the director of the Carnegie Moscow Center, who has been with the center since its inception, and Alexander Gabriev, a senior fellow and the chair of the Russia in the Asia Pacific program at the Carnegie Moscow Center. Welcome to two of you. Great to, to be you. with you. Thank it's you. almost like an annual gather together <laughs> with the two of you. We are delighted to be back. <laughs> so, Mr. Gabriev, exactly how the role of Russia do you think? with the recent change in geopolitics, for example, uh, has been making Russia to the center stage of the world. I think Russia is very unique in utilizing its limited resources and punching above its weight to make its voice heard and put its flag on global stage. Why would you say that? Uh, I think Russia is used to be the size of Guangdongsheng in terms of GDP three years back. Guangdong province, which now, is one of the southern right, provinces in China. Now it's getting smaller. It's closer to Shandong province. But still, 
it has a very sizable appetite for using its military mm. and go into really tough places like the Middle East and win wars there, like the war in Syria. Mm. That's very unique. And I guess that is really the expertise of Mr. Trenning here. How has Moscow been able to leverage its power and capacity now in the Middle East with the U.S. trying to quote-unquote withdraw from the region? Now we do not know whether it's just one administration or a long time go of the U.S. administrations, but from you, Mr. Trenning. Well, first of all, I would like to say that uh, the GDP is just one measuring stick mm. to measure any country's weight in the world. So people would be uh, um, ill-served by looking simply at the GDP comparisons. Russia is more than, than any province of China. Uh, and it has um, an important role to play, I think, uh, using its uh, clearly limited resources, but using them in a fairly um, strategic way in a few places like the Middle East. The Middle East is actually the gateway for Russia rolling out its um, newly regained status as a great power. There are very few countries that can perform the way Russia has performed in the Middle East. It's not just uh, throwing your weight around. It's not just showing your military capacity, although it's partly that. Yeah. The more important thing is the uh, ability to combine military power and diplomatic expertise to uh, get some imperfect solutions to insoluble problems. Mm. Russia, according to media reports at least, have been starting some kinds of uh, military actions against the, the so-called rebels in the region or the oppositions in the region. Uh, but how is Russia trying to play that balance card in a way. I think you answered yourself. Uh, you answered your own question, basically. <laughs> you, you, you used the That's word. the worst question that your journalist would ask. Come on, anyway, come on. You, 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 don't know, you don't know what I'm going to say. <laughs> Go ahead. You don't know what the, what the actual answer was. The answer c was contained in your word balance. Now, Russia has managed to achieve uh, something tangible in Syria because it learned the game of balance. Mm. You have to balance various forces. You never align yourself, you never wed yourself fully 100% to any of the players. And you never make any of the players mm. your permanent enemy. What happened when the United States decided to pull out its forces from Syria was, some people say it's a gift to Russia. Mm. Trump in his normal manner, his usual manner, is giving Mr. Putin another gift, right? Do you think so? In reality, what happened was Russia was given a poison chalice. Hmm. Russia, Russia uh, uh, was risking a clash between its two allies. One ally sitting in Damascus, Mr. Assad and his forces, and the other ally sitting in Ankara, President Erdogan. And those forces started moving to meet each other yeah. somewhere in the, in, the, in the border area. And then it, it took Mr. Putin and the Russian diplomats and the Russian military um, a lot of effort mm -hmm. to actually manage three forces, the Syrians, the Turks, and the Kurds. Mm. And this was an achievement, but an achievement achieved in a, in a critical situation. So this, is, uh, this has put the Russian position at a higher level in Syria. Let me continue to ask that a bit also about the region in the Middle East. As we all know, it's an oil-rich region. That's why it is so turbulent over the years throughout history. But Russia also has an advantage now in the oil industry. So it's very interesting to see how its geopolitical uh, and strategic uh, uh, goals uh, intertwined right. with this complexity of its economic advantage. Uh, exactly. Uh, one of the things that we talked about the Syria intervention and uh, how much prestige it brought, it brought to Russia, how many more arms contracts it brought to Russia and, and, and other things. Mm -hmm. But it, what, what Russia's involvement in the Middle East has also resulted in a totally new relationship, a cooperative relationship with the oil-rich country Saudi Arabia, the country that sits atop of the, uh, of the world's uh, largest resources uh, uh, 
some of the largest resources of oil in, mm. in the world. And Russia has been able through, again, very careful economic diplomacy this mm -hmm. time to arrange with Saudi Arabia um, a, a scheme, a formula that alo has allowed Russia and Saudi and the, and the rest of the OPEC and plus other countries to keep um, uh, the oil price re reasonably high yes. and stable. And this is an even bigger contribution to Russia's, uh, um, uh, Russia's current uh, situation mm. than, uh, than, than, than arms contracts, for example. Right. The oil price is very, very important. And that is thanks to this link between Moscow and Riyadh that has been there for, for some time and continues to be there. Mm. And that's why the United States come into being, I mean, in a way, because uh, the shell gas has been the U.S.'s future, in a way. And that is uh, one of the most important reasons as to why the U.S. at the moment is not that interested in the Middle East anymore, as many believe. So, uh, Mr. Kabulov, uh, what about the future? Will Russia, in a way, form some kind of economic uh, stronger interaction with the region in the Middle East vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, the U.S. Uh, interest? What is likely to be the general picture as we see so many moving factors? I, I think that Russia is not seeking to be the security, ultimate security guarantor in the region and put its forces permanently somewhere beyond Syria. It will be too Russia. much pressure for but Moscow. But it definitely wants to use it, the leverage that it's now created to continue this beneficial relationship with Saudi mm -hmm. Arabia and to coordinate the oil prices jointly. And I think that's the task which is very much inside and that's very achievable. Mm -hmm. It's a new era of China-Russia relations. After 70 years of diplomatic ties, the two neighbors agreed to keep expanding cooperation. Bilateral trade is on the rise, which now exceeds a hundred billion dollars. The militaries of China and Russia have worked on strengthening mutual abilities through joint exercises. Face-to-face -face meetings of leaders from Beijing and Moscow show how tightly knit they are. Amid global uncertainty, China and Russia hope to set their partnership as an example for major power relations. Asia Pacific, for example, which is your expertise, uh, Mr. Gabweb, uh, we see Russia very active uh, with China, forming partnerships, for example, at SEO, at uh, BRICS, and also on the bilateral uh, interactions uh, very frequently, for example, the Chinese president and the Russian president. So, how do you see this uh, economic and trade links? between these two countries and their roles on the multilateral platform paving the way for some kinds of evolving of relationship between the two. If we look structurally, Russia and China are just mutual fits. Russia has abundance of natural resources, lacks investment, mm. needs infrastructure and needs technology. China is the opposite, huge surplus of capital, huge market for commodities that Russia can provide. China right now is just 18% of Russia's total trade. Mm -hmm. used to be 10% just six years ago. So it's growing along the trade with volume. Political with political will. With political will. So come first, will, and then there's uh, economic attack. it's also Russia up. waking up to the size and opportunities provided by the Chinese market. Mm -hmm. An increasing number of firms were to tap in. And here, the trade war comes in. As long as there is no trade deal between the U.S. and China, and as long as China doesn't need to purchase large volumes of American oil, mm -hmm. as is envisaged in the phase one of the deal, Russia has a lot of space to really come in the market. Mm -hmm. and I think that Chinese market for hydrocarbons will grow, so it's a place for everybody, but Russia is really strategic in tapping into those new opportunities. Very interesting. You see uh, both on the general picture and also you see also that uh, reflecting certain examples that uh, Mr. Trending, for example, uh, agricultural products. Uh, Russia could provide uh, some kinds of alternative to the Chinese market compared to what the U.S. could provide agricultural products, for example. And we've seen that over the past few months uh, when the a trade war, quote unquote, going on between China and the United States. Meanwhile, on a general picture, um, when 
China and the United States, the latter calling China as the strategic rival once again, if you look at the Pence's recent speech about China-U.S. relations, uh, is certainly an interesting player in this sense, Mr. Chenning. Well, first of all, uh, I would say that uh, the vice president's speech, the U.S. vice president's speech uh, this year, uh, looked a little bit more conciliatory. Uh, compared to last year's, yes. Com indeed. Compared to last year's, probably for domestic political reasons in the United States. I think the big change that uh, I experienced uh, since my visit to uh, Beijing a year ago was the uh, deterioration, uh, market deterioration of uh, Sino-American relations. And I think uh, we need to uh, realize, if we haven't already, that uh, China and the United States are in a systemic rivalry. It's not political. It's not uh, because of this election, because of this man. But it's, uh, it's a competition between the two mightiest economies in the world. And that's, that's very, very, very important. It will last some time, etc. Is that the Russian view? Uh, it's, it's that it's on a it's strategic an, rivalry. It's, it's an, an, an analyst view. Oh, I think okay. that, you know, various people uh, in the United States would share that view. We discussed it among ourselves, and um, uh, many of my uh, American colleagues would, would agree with, uh, with uh, the rivalry becoming systemic. And that's, mm. uh, that's, that's, a, that's a wholly new ball game. Maybe mm. it's not a ball game anymore. It's maybe it's some, ki some other kind of game, but something fundamental has changed in the last two years in Sino-American relations. So how is Russia, Moscow, you know, looking at the picture, maybe in the way that you do, do but, or maybe in a different lens, uh, looking um, at this role? Uh, Mr. Putin, when he was asked that question at the St. Petersburg Economic Forum That's right. uh, in, uh, in uh, th this earlier this year, he said, well, we're like, you know, this proverbial monkey that looks down on, you know, the, the tigers in the valley. Uh, I'm not sure it's a very uh, apt description, frankly. Uh, Russia is in, a, is in a different position. I would say this. Uh, well, what is the different position well, the you're different talking about? The different position is this. Uh, Russia has relations with uh, China and the United States, which are starkly different. The relationship with China is, is very close. It's, uh, it's officially called strategic partnership, and then they add so many other words to that. <laughs> uh, the relationship with the United States is confrontation. You better catch up, Mr. Trending. There are a lot of adjectives uh, going on right here. Well, from I'm, time I'm, to I'm, time not, I'm not in that business. My <laughs> job does not depend on whether I remember all those words or not. Right. Go ahead. Uh, so I think that for Russia, the important thing is to manage the relationship, the very unequal relationships and very, um, uh, very uh, let's say asymmetrical rather than unequal relationships with the two superpowers mm -hmm. of this world in a way that would uh, preserve Russia's own equilibrium. Mm -hmm. For Russia, the most important thing is not equality. Equality cannot be achieved either with China or with the United States. Yeah. What can be achieved, though, is equilibrium. You stand on your own feet. You do not tilt this way, that way. You do not become over-dependent on this country or that country. Yeah. You do not bandwagon on Washington or Beijing. Okay. You're Moscow. You're your own man. You're <laughs> Russia. Or woman, for that matter. Okay. All right. Then. <laughs> I got the analogy okay, anyway. But, but Mr. Gabriev, I mean, if you look at what is going on between Moscow and Washington, it's not that pleasant. I mean, Russia, quote unquote, the name itself seems to be political toxic, as you may know, on Capitol Hill, at least, in the United States. So, and the investigation about the Russia-related issues now already become a so-called criminal investigation. You see the degree of it. So, uh, Mr. Gabuev, no matter how much Russia wants to be, quote unquote, taking advantage or uh, taking a strategically important position in this regard, it is not going to be regarded as neutral uh, by the Washington. So how would you see that role that Russia has to bear in mind? I think that... Uh, it's very interesting. I, th I think that sources of Russia-U.S. confrontation are much deeper than just Russian interference in the U.S. election or Trump or... Uh, being accused, by the way. Or the whole political earthquake and the toxic cloud around Russia and accusations. So how complicated is it? Is there, there was history of the Cold War, of course. There is history and there is power balance and a question of Russia's place in the world 
and the U.S. accepts of Russia playing a special, not mm -hmm. an equal, but a special place in the world and its own you know, neighborhood in particular. Mm. Russia as a sovereign player which doesn't really subscribe to U.S. unilateral vision. So that's at the crux of the issue. And mm. then when it comes to Russia's relationship with China, I think that we share so many interests like security at the common border mm. and this economic relationship and uh, the similar, some similarities in our political systems that it's just very impossible for me to imagine that Russia will just abandon its partnership with China mm. in order to improve relationship with the West. Mm. It doesn't mean that Russia will maintain its confrontation forever and I think that Europe and other players in Asia have also an important role in this Russia's attempt to balance mm. its relationship with China that is increasingly asymmetrical. So they also have an agency and they also have an interest to bring Russia into equilibrium. Interesting. Well things are evolving so fast. I hope our conversation can really stand at least 24 hours. <laughs> That's of course, it's just a we'll joke. We'll be back in a year. Uh, yeah, no well, there we go. Yes. And then we learn all the adjectives needed, at least the new era That's will right. be with us. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Gabu F and uh, Mr. Trenning. Always a pleasure to see both of you in Beijing Thanks for your interaction with the Chinese community thank as well. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Welcome. We love thank to you. be here. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you so much. And that is all the time we have for today. If you'd like to see more, try to find us World Inside CGTN into your search engine or check out our YouTube channel. Also follow us on Twitter, Facebook. From me, Tian Wei, and everyone on the World Inside team, thanks for watching and tune in again next time for more insights across China. And